Okay, this is our uh, next video in the Revelation Education series. Um, we have been covering the opening of the seals of Revelation. Um, if you haven't been able to view those before, I would recommend you do before viewing this. We had already in the last one opened the first four seals, and now we're going to be getting in the fifth and sixth. But before we do, we'll just do a little review of the four because they lead right into these fifth and sixth seals. There is a definitely a relationship between them all that way. So this diagram I've shown before, it helps us to be able to see kind of the full picture of the revelation um, and its purpose. It's a, um, a very well laid out plan. It's not just chapters and scriptures, but it actually is made up of the seven church ages and it shows the seals being opened up that are correspond to those and then also trumpets and vials of wrath being poured out and it's all part of a battle plan to be able to expose the hypocrisy of false religion and help God's people to get free from that. And it follows the pattern of the um, battle plan that was shown when Joshua went into uh, with the children of people of God to conquer the promised land. And they had a similar plan that God gave them to defeat Jericho, which was a great walled city that stood in the way. So in brief, I'm just kind of telling you the whole revelation there. You see the darkened out first four seals. Those are what we covered already. We're going to briefly kind of go into an introduction again to them, starting with the first three. <clears throat> and as I said, these seals correspond to the different ages of the church age. And so the first one being opened up corresponds to the beginning of the gospel day, the church age of Ephesus. And at this time, what we see is a ministry that is starting out humble and faithful to Almighty God. We're talking about First, the ministry that Jesus established when he came here, first when he was on earth. But it also reflects spiritually today for us a uh, lesson for any minister that is starting out and continuing to serve God in a faithful way. Things that they need to do and to avoid, right? So they don't fall because many have fallen in the process. And so this story of the seals being opened gives us a a brief overview and it's showing it from a battle perspective again this is now talking about a battle plan and so horses represent warfare they represent the army of the Lord and they represent the armies that came against them spiritual armies we're talking about you'll notice that when it starts out in Ephesus that is a white horse pure and white because it's reflecting the way the church it was established and is supposed to be and Jesus is the one who's sitting on that horse, who's in control totally. And he is the one who is shooting out the thundering arrows. Arrows being described as, Jesus said, lightning with the gospel will be like lightning that will shine from one end of heaven to the other. And it's so his thundering lightning arrows. Um, it's the gospel message that's being shown forth. Go forth there. And that's the way it started out. But later on, second seal was opened. And then we saw the horse had changed and the rider had changed. And we see that this rider is no longer Jesus. It's basically a rider that represents a ministry that has taken a great sword, the greatest sword that exists, which is the word of God. The scriptures tell us that and has taken it into their hands because the scriptures also tells us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It's not the sword of the ministry. Big distinction there. Because the ministry, who's true and faithful and humble, needs to keep it in the hands of the Spirit. This shows that a ministry took it in their own hands. And it says that they took peace from one another and they killed one another with it. And so, and the horse, which is supposed to represent the church, is no longer pure and white. It's becoming blood guilty. This is what happens when people take the word into their own hands. Very, very serious things. And I'll have you note that this represents the second church age, which is Smyrna. And in that Smyrna church age, which represents a period of time when the gospel began to be, uh, the scriptures and the different things that have been written began to be canonized into a, uh, a, a canon of scripture. And there were even arguments amongst them about that. But men began to become more and more, quote unquote, experts in the scriptures and taking it in their hands and figuring out what should be and what should not be. They had many, many councils during these times, and they divided, right, east and west in different directions. This is a reflection of what goes on when a ministry takes this into their own hands. And that's exactly what happened throughout history. 
and it can still happen today. Then after all the things get kind of separated out and we had the large was most one going forth there, the, the Catholic Church and the ages of the Catholic Church, which are described as the Dark Ages. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the horse became dark. Darkness means that there's not a lot of light or truth coming through anymore. And the person who's riding the horse is not Jesus Christ. It's a man, it's a, it's a system of, of mankind control, and they have taken the word and turned it into a scale where they are measuring it out according to their own benefit and purposes. And this is what happens is when a ministry gets into this type of mode where they become self-defensive and self-protected of their fort and of their area. I'm talking about things that happened today. It happened back then in a larger scale. They start leveraging the word of God for their own control. And when they start doing that, they start picking the scriptures that they need out of there to be able to deal with situations, right? They pick them out and they leverage them. And they don't use a whole bunch of anything else except for what they use for leveraging their control. And then literally the people begin to starve because the word's just being measured out and they're not really given any kind of depth and especially any connection with the spirit of God with it to be able to go forth. And so it becomes a control thing. And we've seen that happen during the dark ages there. Then next, when the fourth seal was open, it showed because one of the living creatures basically said, come and see to each of those uh, seals as they were opened by Jesus Christ. And um, this particular, these living creatures represent the ministry. Again, if you haven't looked at previous videos, do that so you can understand. But these living creatures, in particular the one that said, come and see when the fourth seal was opened, had wings as an eagle. And the reason why it's that way, because it says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. This is in Isaiah 40. And it says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's talking about a ministry during this time when all the confusion of different religious things were going on. Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, and their, all their divisions and things that they did as man began to garner control and to establish their separate church identities and the doctrines that went along with it. None of them fully following the gospel of Jesus Christ, except for people who had an honest heart who basically just took in. There were people always during that time, in spite of all the confusion. And there was a ministry still inspired during that time. And the type of ministry that describes that, able, that was able to survive all this is a ministry with wings as eagles. They were able to rise above all that confusion. And still, from then on out, it's been the same way. A ministry that has wings that's able to rise above. They're able to wait on God and the Spirit of God for the message in spite of the confusion that man has created, that is the ministry that has truly led and taught God's true people. And so this is the, the understanding, the message we're getting through all of this. And so it describes the horse and the way it changed in the fourth seal. It became pale. It was neither this or that, neither totally dark, neither totally light, a mixture of many different things. It says, and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell fall with him. Condition that basically puts people in so much confusion that, that they are spiritually killed living underneath that condition. And it says power was given them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, to kill with hunger, withholding of the word and just dishing it out. Things that happened already before, in other words, the Protestant had the capability to do all that had been done before. To use the word for, to kill one another, their knowledge of it, or to use it to control and to keep back, to control the people. And it says also with the beasts of the earth, showing that the organizations, and we're going to get more into this later on in Revelation, but the carnal fleshly control organizations of humankind, in the church basically is like a beast and the reason why it's describing that it says man in the scriptures without god and without his spirit is nothing more than like a beast in other words what drives him and what motivates him what moves him is his fleshly connection to the earth and his desires down here 
And when that works amongst that which claims to be the church, it becomes a beast organization, whether it's called Catholic, Protestant, or any other name. And it's showing that with those beasts of the earth, which represent kind of those larger organizational type structures and hierarchies, that also during that time that did a lot of killing. Spiritually, we're talking about, and also literally. And this is something we're going to see because, again, this is a spiritual warfare it's talking about. But once again, I just want to show the slide here and highlight what we're going to be talking about next. We just gave a summary of the first four, but now we're going to be getting into the fifth and sixth. We barely touched the fifth the last time, but we're going to get into it a lot depth, more depth now. So this is mainly what our lesson is about today, but I wanted to give that context because it flows forth to what we're talking about today. So the result of spiritual warfare, many personal sacrifices going on. And it says in Revelation, the sixth chapter, verse nine, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw essentially the results. I saw under the altar. What is he talking about? He's talking about the altar of sacrifice. And that's why I have a picture of this uh, Old Testament um, representation here in this picture of the uh, Old Testament altar of sacrifices. This is where they would put on all the different sacrifices that the children of Israel would do um, during that time, the Old Testament age. And they would sacrifice the altars, sacrifice the sacrifices there and burn them. And he says here in this scripture, and when, I had, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O God, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? What are they saying? They're saying, Lord, we've suffered for the opening of four seals and now the fifth. And we're still suffering persecution at the hands of those who especially claim to be Christian. And we're even being killed for it. Lord, how long will this go on? This is the cry that's going up before Almighty God. What are these voices under the altar? Under the altar was nothing but ashes in the Old Testament. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that God still remembers these who have passed on. And he remembers all their cries and their sufferings. He has not forgotten God remembers the cries of his people. <clears throat> this was true all the way back into Genesis. When Cain and Abel existed back then, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Abel was righteous and accepted of a God. <clears throat> excuse me. Cain was jealous of his brother and he killed his brother. And God came to Cain and he said, where's your brother? And Cain said, I'm my brother's keeper. He tried to hide and, and act like nothing happened. <clears throat> and God said to him, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So what he was showing there is that although his voice has gone, his body and his, his sacrifice by your hands has gone down, I still hear. It's crying to me. I hear what happened to him and the suffering that you caused upon him. <clears throat> and that is what Jesus here is also saying in Revelation when he talks about the ashes underneath the altar. I hear those voices. I remember every one of them. This is why it tells us that when we are partaking of the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, so many people are way too shallow in the way they teach that. They don't teach the depth and the fullness of what it says. Because they teach about the benefits and they teach about, you know, just the sweet fellowship that people, the camaraderie or whatever people have. But it's much deeper than that. Jesus didn't teach it just so it's a benefits program and a, a, a fellowship program of, you know, I love you, you love me, easy going stuff. No. Let me read it to you. We need to understand, discern fully what he's talking about. When Jesus brought that to his apostles and disciples, he said, 
partake of this. This is my body. Partake of this. This is my blood which is shed for you, my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Be a partaker of this body and of this blood. Not just from the sense of being saved, but a partaker of the sacrifice that I have given for others and for you. I want you also to be a partaker with me in the sacrifice. It's not that we can save people, but that we need to have the sacrificial love that Jesus showed. He said, and he taught us to love one another as I have loved you. And you can't do that unless you're willing to partake of that body and blood as a sacrifice where you suffer and you bear with the sufferings of others too. It's much deeper than just a benefits program. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 27 through 29, he says, Wherefore, whosoever eat of this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In other words, you don't comprehend what this is about. And you're doing it unworthily, and it'll tell us later on, it's because you don't even discern fully what you're doing to the rest of the body of Christ. 28, it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Verse 29, we're reading in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Why did he say that? Did he say that because he meant that this was the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ? No. He's talking about people who weren't worthy because they were not embracing the sufferings themselves and they were even causing sufferings for others. When you are serving God, it is a struggle and it is a difficulty and you need to be able to have a sacrificial love to be able to include everyone that God wants to include and God wants to long suffer with. If you don't, you will end up using the gospel for your own purposes, taking it in your own hands and affecting the church in a bad way. And then there will be walls and divisions and you'll be guilty like the red horse rider was, you'll be guilty for the body and blood of Jesus Christ, not discerning the Lord's body. Serious lesson here. Serious lessons. Again, as I said, the results of spiritual warfare, warfare against many Christians is that um, we're, we're beginning a vision here where we see these people under the altar of sacrifices, of sacrifice, crawling, crying up to the Lord, the vision is the martyrdom that's gone on throughout all history. There are ashes underneath the altar. And if you were to read even a book that I believe was published about this same time, it's called Fox's Book of Martyrs, you would essentially read what is described in Revelation as underneath that altar of sacrifice. Again, another scripture that reflects this remembrance God has, it says, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. God remembers all our cries and all our tears because of persecutions and suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everyone's going to reap for what they sow. God is going to bring judgment, and there's going to come a time when he's going to clean house. And this is what he's basically telling them that are on the altar. He's giving them an answer that righteous judgment is coming. It says in Revelation 6 and 11, reading more about this um, fifth seal, it says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, he's telling them there's still persecution to go on, but there's coming a time, and I'm coming, when I'm going to clean house. Now, this fifth seal being opened represents the correlation with the Sardis church age. And in that church age, remember, Jesus told them, be ready, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming especially for the marriage feast, and during that marriage feast, I'm going to clean house. I'm going to clean house. The time is going to come. 
There's another scripture I'd like to read to you. It's in Psalms 18, 6 through 7. It says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even unto his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. This is a prophecy even that is reflecting the voices and the cries of God's people under the altar and what happens next. And what happens next is when the sixth seal is opened. Revelation 6 and 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Jesus is coming to deal with hypocrisy that has been ravaging and affecting the church. And he's going to clean house. And so this scripture here where it talks about the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair and the moon becoming his blood is spoken of at different times in the scriptures. And it's really reflecting that when Jesus comes and he begins to execute judgment upon hypocrisy is that for many people that are hypocrites claiming to be God's people, the light of the New Testament, which should be light to them, is darkness because it's judgment upon their hypocrisy. And the Old Testament and its light that it gives becomes as blood because they become blood guilty. This especially happened in the beginning of the Gospel day. It was prophesied that way, and it's a prophecy that it actually looks forward even to the day of the sixth seal time. I like to read in Joel 2, 31-32. Notice the wording here, very similar to what you see in 6 and 12. The sun shall be turned, this is verse 31 of Joel 2, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So this is talking about when that day is coming and that judgment is coming, that's what it's going to be for many people. And it shall come to pass, verse 32, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion, it's talking about the spiritual true church, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This is truly reflecting that this is a day of purging and a day of cleaning house and a day that identifies the, the remaining few who are still true. And it shows them as ones who answer the Lord's call. That's why when it talks about church and church of God and all of that, it's really talking about those who have answered the call of Almighty God. Also, this is exactly what was said and preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Listen to the wording. Peter quoted these scriptures also. Acts 2 and 20 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter was showing that in the morning time of the gospel day, that is what was happening then, is that God, through his Holy Spirit, working through his ministry, was cleaning house of the nation of Jerusalem. And there was going to be just a remnant left that were serving God out of that whole nation. And the rest was going to be destroyed, and Jerusalem was destroyed thoroughly within roughly 30 years later, totally wiped out. God does come and clean house, and he does, has done it a number of times. As I said, these scriptures are in Joel 2, 31, 32, and Acts 2, 20 through 21. And what it shows is follows the quote of the scriptures what happened in the deliverance. Remember all the things that it said here, because we're going to see it reflected again. Revelation 6.13, the next scripture of the sixth seal being opened. And it says, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Stars, we are shown in Revelation, the first chapter, represent the ministry. So this is showing that in this day, when there's a shaking and a cleaning of house, there is an exposure of a ministry that is fallen, that is no longer faithful. And these ministries represent things that have resisted God and his truth in the fulfillment of it. I'd like to read you a prophecy in Nahum, third chapter, 12th verse. It says, 
All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. And with the first ripe figs, if they should be shaken, they shall even fall un into the mouth of the eater. These ministry represent strongholds. Remember, we're talking about this is about defeating Babylon and the strongholds of hypocrisy. These ministry represent, they are largely a part of the strongholds of Babylon, of, of uh, hypocritical religion. It's showing that they're going to fall. And when God cleans house, this is what happens. In Isaiah 34, 4 through 5, it says, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. It's showing that the heavens are going to be split wide open. And all their hosts shall fall down, as a leaf falleth off from the vine, and as falling fig from the tree, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. You notice he didn't say the minister's sword. He said, my sword. The one that's in the hand of the Spirit is going to be bathed in heaven, and the heavens are going to be opened as a scroll. When the heavens are open, and we see up into God's heavens, we see Almighty God on the throne. He's the only King, and King's Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ there. And we see all of God's people, one throng, worshiping God. There are no church divisions and sects, and there are no church groups either, nor individual congregations that aren't fellowshipping one another. None of that exists there. And so when he spiritually opens those doors and it shines all the way down onto earth, there's a real shaking because those things realize that they don't have any right to exist, those divisional identities. And so that's what he's saying. This has happened when the heavens are opened as a scroll. And we're going to see, is this is an Isaiah I just read to you. Is this is what's happening here in Revelation? Let's read the next scripture. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. I'm reading from Revelation 6 now, what we just read in Isaiah. This is showing that the heavens are split open, being apart. And if you recall, this sixth seal represents the sixth church age, which is Philadelphia. And in there, Jesus said to them, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. So Jesus opened the doors of heaven, so that man can have that spiritual insight and the vision that comes from Almighty God for the church. And when that comes down to earth, then all these other things are realizing, these or religious organizations and divisions, that they have no right to exist the way that they are. And so what happens? We'll see what happens when the heavens are open as a scroll and they're rolled together. It shows us in the same scripture, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. These mountain and islands represent the strongholds of man's religious movements, man's religious organizations, the things that keep people separated, claiming to be Christian but in different pieces and parts. And it says in Revelation 6 and 4, And the heaven departed as a scroll as when it is opened together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And this is exactly what happened. As I said, when they're split open, it exposes the fact that these organizations have no right to exist. And so when they do, it says they're moved out of their places. It doesn't say that they've been, been destroyed yet. That's the one thing that we need to get a hold of here. In the sixth seal, it did not destroy the mountains and islands. It moved them out of their places. And a gathering began to happen into two camps. The gathering of hypocrisy and the gathering of the true people of God. The gathering of hypocrisy began to happen just as in the sixth seal, this open door and judgment upon hypocrisy was happening is right during the same time in history, and we're talking about late 1800s, early 1900s, when there was a, a pure light shown that way and a movement of God's Spirit, and many people began to come out of the hypocrisy and the falseness of all the divisions and say, this is enough, enough. This is not God's plan. God's plan is for one people, one church, a holy people that are sanctified and are fully consecrated to Jesus Christ and are living as one under the direction of the Word and the Spirit, not under the direction of man's control. 
And when that began to come together, man began also to create their coming together. Because that's what Satan does. He opposes the church and whatever they do. And so during that time, into existence became the starting of this. It was called the World Parliament of Religions. And it began to gather all kinds of religions together. Later gone, it morphed into the World Council of Churches. This is the movement of mountains and islands out of their places because they cannot and they have no right to exist separately. And they realize we've got to create some kind of oneness also. And it's nothing more than a ecumenical amalgamation of different ideas and thoughts. It is nothing that's underneath God and his Holy Spirit. It's still man in control. It's still an attempt to have man in control, but creating some kind of notion of oneness. And even the nations began to do this. The United Nations shortly around that time followed suit and started to become first the League of Nations and then later on the United Nations. These are all coming together in the last days because God is gathering together into two camps. The movement of mountains reflects Christ's words, removing a spiritually fallen people. Jesus spoke about this. He was going to Jerusalem and he spoke to his disciples at one time about that as he was going there. And he had talked about how he saw no fruit on a tree. And it says that Jesus laid judgment on the tree. Let it be withered. No fruit anymore. Because there was nothing to satisfy Christ. And they saw how quickly that tree was withered. And he said, why are you impressed by that? He says, you can pray and say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and it shall be done. He wasn't talking about physical mountains. He was talking about spiritual mountains. That you as a ministry, speaking to the apostles and disciples, you can pray and have the hypocrisy removed. And God Almighty will do that and cause these things to be removed and keep them cast in the sea and shown as being nothing that is of benefit to God anymore. Cast into the sea. Later on, we'll see where seas represent people, multitudes, and nations. In other words, that these mountains of religions and different things have just come down to the earthly-minded uh, portions of mankind and their sensual desires. It's basically what it's showing. But again, as I said, every mountain will move out of their places. Um, in uh, Isaiah 13 and 4, it says, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. God is doing his revelation. He is gathering two camps for a battle. It's described very specifically this way later on Revelation as we get into it. But I'm giving you a little bit of insights earlier here and showing it's even reflected in prophecy. But you know what? It was reflected this way even in the beginning of the gospel day. The apostles and the disciples of the Lord after the day of Pentecost recognized that this was the battle that was going on. And they were in a serious battle. Everything was being gathered against them and they needed the Lord's help. And so there was a special prayer for boldness that went on in Acts the fourth chapter. And I want to read just... Part, part of it, verse 26 through 29, gatherings going on. It says, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles. Now, Herod and Pontius Pilate were enemies before they had to deal with Christ. And then when they were part of that court that condemned Jesus Christ, they became buddies. They became gathered together. So it says Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, that means the Romans and all of them, and the people of Israel. Those who are supposed to be God's people are gathering with these pagans, organizations, and they're all gathering together. I'll read it again. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that they, with all boldness they may speak thy word. They were having this prayer in Acts 4, 26 through 29. And it was, no, hide us, you, you were afraid. No, give us boldness because this is your purpose. You have gathered all these forces against 
the truth and the gospel, and we are part of the army of the Lord. Give us boldness to fulfill your will and purpose in this. And that's what we need today because all the forces of Satan and all the hypocrisy of religion are all being gathered together and they're being gathered together against the truth of the gospel. We are in this time also. And we are going to need the boldness. What happens to these that are trying to gather together and to hide from the open heavens? Revelation 6 and 15, we're still reading the sixth seal and it says, And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Remember, those rocks and the mountains, those, those things represent false religious organizations and teachings. And it's showing that they're trying to hide their sin and their hypocrisy by these false teachings. They don't want to be exposed and they don't want to get free. Isaiah 29 and 15 spoke of this. It says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? Who knoweth us? They're trying to hide themselves. <clears throat> this is also reflected in Isaiah 28, 14 through 17. <clears throat> there it says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves, our rocks and our mountains we are hiding. Verse 16 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. 17. Judgment also shall I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding places. What God is showing here is that full light of the gospel, your hypocrisy isn't going to stand when the heavens are open and they departed as a scroll. You're not going to be able to stand in that day. When it's time to clean house, Jesus cleans house. And there's a time that it comes. He did it twice, even while he was on earth. In the physical temple in Jerusalem, he cleaned house. And when he did it, he did it with anger in his eyes and with a whip in his hand. He showed that when it was time to clean that physical house, it was going to be cleaned. And he cleaned them out, and he did it twice. Today, we are in a day and age, the final day and age. Some hundred years ago, there was a spiritual time when God had a movement where he began to clean house. Today, he wants to do it again. It's time to clean house of everything and even of groups of those who claim to be the church. It's time to clean house of that mess. May God help us all. All right. <clears throat> That's all that I have for in this video. Next, though, we are going to continue to talk about the sixth seal because it gets into a lot more stuff there. And so um, we will cover that at that time. Stay with us as we continue to walk through this Revelation education series. I hope it has been a benefit to you all. And I desire your prayers. The Lord will continue to help us to complete this out through the whole Revelation message. All right. Thank you.